You previously had a promising career as an investment banker, but found your way mm. into the world of numismatics. How did that occur? Well, uh, I worked for the bank for a number of years and, um, you know, you just, you know, when your heart's not really in it, my heart was always in coins. I didn't exactly have a p passion for banking. And um, thankfully the recession came along. I was made redundant and um, I moved on, I moved on to bigger and better things. I started selling coins on eBay, like a lot of the, uh, like a lot of the smaller collectors and dealers. And um, before I knew it, I was uh, making a little bit of money, then a little bit more. And uh, suddenly it was enough to um, pay my rent and pay for some groceries. And here we are 10 years later, I'm, uh, I'm a, a little bit bigger and, got a really good range of coins and I'm loving it, loving yeah. every day. Oh, dude, that's excellent. And that, that, that perfectly leads into my next question, which was, you were obviously, uh, and it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but it's like you were sort of, at the, you know, on the cutting edge of online trading, as it were, and particularly with something like numismatics, which is traditionally a, you know, I want to see the coin in hand type of industry. So what, what were some mm. of the... Uh, I suppose, what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome in your journey thus far, particularly early on? Yeah, well, the biggest obstacle with a coin dealer is you uh, want to show the collector the coins and the collector wants to see the coins physically uh, in general. But uh, in 2005, 2006, the internet was um, a big thing. It was starting up. Websites were getting cheaper and cheaper to create. And PCGS the professional coin grading service had just been introduced into Australia by another dealer, um, Pacific Rim Coins here in Sydney. Uh, they brought PCGS to Australia um, in 2005, 2006. I saw the proprietor of that business. He had his display case full of coins in PCGS slabs. And I thought, this is the way of the future. You have a third party grading service that assesses the condition of the coin I can do some really good photography of a coin. You put it up on a website and you almost don't have to see the coin. Now, ideally, it's nice to be able to see the coin, but with the PCGS grade, PCGS's high resolution images and um, a little bit of a description from my point of view, how it looks and so on. Um, I think it's the greatest way to, to be able to sell coins while not being able to show the physical coin to the collector. Uh, it, it just worked. The internet, PCGS just came together right in the beginning when the internet was brand new in the coin business. And here we are. I am curious as to what your take is on it, you know, about 15 years forward from that first uh, bit of exposure PCGS had to the Australian market. And what's your take mm. on its uh, adoption or acceptance in the Australian market? How, how do you feel it's been received thus far? Well, we always knew it would take a long time. Uh, it took 10 years in Canada to, 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 to get going. It takes 10 years uh, in general for the broader market to look at a third party graded coin and decide this is okay. We will accept this for what it is. Um, there was a lot of derision in the beginning, a lot, of, uh, a lot of dealers, a lot of collectors claiming that PC just did not know what they were doing. They did not know how to grade Australian coins. Uh, of course, uh, there was always resistance from the uh, more established dealers. Um, but over time, collectors, especially collectors, began to see how PCGS would pick up on problem coins in a way that the old school collectors uh, and dealers would not. So clean coins, damaged coins, coins from jewelry, coins that have been tooled. PCGS picked up a lot of these errors where the local coin dealer in Australia would either not mention these problems with the coins or uh, not be aware of them. So once collectors started to realize that PCGS was actually providing a service, notwithstanding their grading standard, but yeah. PCGS was picking up on problems and flaws with coins that diminished the coin's value uh, in a way that nobody else did locally in the, in the country. I think that's quite fascinating because it is obviously mm. something that a lot of seasoned veterans of the industry take a great deal of pride in that their capacity to effectively grade a coin. So the idea yeah. of putting that in the hands of someone else would, it would, yeah, it just wouldn't register. So that's something that obviously you've 
embraced with open arms and by the, by the sounds of it, uh, been, been all the better for it. Yeah, well, it helped not having any reputation to begin with. You see, what PC just gives you as a younger dealer is reputation. Um, some of the older dealers have got reputations going back 30 or 40 years. Their parents were in the industry. They've got a long pedigree as a numismatic professional in the business. I didn't have that. And the quickest way for me to develop a reputation is simply to um, borrow the reputation of an experienced third party such as PCGS. And that's what I did. And naturally, if you're a professional dealer, you've been operating since the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, you don't feel like you need to borrow that reputation from a third party. In fact, some dealers might feel offended that they might have to. But yeah. over time, yeah, over time, I feel like um, it's it was the right decision. It saved me from having to build a reputation up from scratch. And I think the collectors are better for it as well. For sure. That's, that's, that's very, dude, that's very well put. Uh, that's cool. Um, what the back, back, I'm, I'm not going to let you get get away with this though. Give me some of the, the issues, like what, sure you, you have to have had problems, right? Like certain yep. aspects of starting your business that just were, yeah, yeah. Hurdles to overcome because it, it can't all be as, as sweet as you've just made it sound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it's a small business. There's always going to be problems, whether it's setting up a website or finding staff or even just simply exporting and importing coins seamlessly. All of this took time. All of this cost money. And um, I mean, a specific example is in 2006 or 2007, websites like Wix or Big Commerce or Magento, these websites didn't exist. So these websites helped people like you and me create websites from scratch with a hit of a button and you drag and drop functions and then you've got a website it was really really simple in 2005 2006 that didn't exist you had to build a website from scratch like literally from scratch and i've got no computer experience at all no internet experience no website experience so i had to get another developer who was fortunately a friend of mine and didn't charge me much at the time it was affordable enough for me to be able to build a website from scratch in a way that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Now, a, co a collector or a dealer in the year 2020 doesn't face the same hurdles. If they want to set up a website, they can do that really, really straightforward. And it, it'll cost a fraction of what it cost me um, in 2006. Yeah, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I was curious about. And I, I think that I can only imagine, you know, uh, it, it was a, a different, a totally different, uh, oh. arena then and hearing that yeah when you when oh, the different. fact that you started when you did is uh mm. yeah that 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 fascinated me so back on to pcgs right something that yeah. i have heard a lot about and only uh when the opportunity came up to handle some really high-end rarities that were in these slabs is a lot of people talk about the older PCGS slabs, uh, the, the ones with the green labels on them, and have speculated that perhaps the grading was a little harsher back then. And if submitted for a regrading, there is a, a decent scope for an, an increase in the grade. Is this something that you've heard of? And do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I haven't seen enough coins in green holders to be able to take advantage of that if that is something I can take advantage of but I've heard that rumor as well I've heard that if you take the older slabs you crack them out you resend them in you'll get better grades I haven't found that I've I've I have resubmitted just between you and me I have resubmitted coins to just PCGS. between you and me and the rest of the world <laughs> well look there's no need to hide it but yeah I have submitted coins to PC just that have been already graded at, uh, with the hope of getting a better grade Yep. And it doesn't happen that often. I do believe PCGS is consistent most of the time. Uh, there is always a chance that it can upgrade. And sometimes when you get a coin and you look at it and you think this is so much better than the grade it was assigned, uh, you have a go. And I haven't seen any benefit from sending the older coins in. Whether I send new coins or old coins, I think they all have a chance at upgrading if they were undergraded to begin with. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's interesting. That's something that, again, uh, I, I similarly haven't had enough experience with them. But yeah, that's very interesting. 
So I feel we're both incredibly fortunate in this industry. And in some senses, I feel like I get to live vicariously through some of the clients I deal with. And mm. I'm curious to learn from you if there is a particular coin or collection that you've been involved with that is the most memorable or that you're most proud of. Yes. Uh, two coins come to mind. Uh, the first coin is an 1856 Sydney Mint Sovereign. It's graded MS62. That's Mint State 62. It's from the Quartermaster Collection. It is also from a Spink Noble auction, November 1980, where it was featured on the front cover of the catalog. And the coin is so memorable that Jim Noble himself remembered which auction it was from uh, when I mentioned it to him. Anyway, I bought the coin, I bought the coin raw, uh, where it featured prominently in uh, some overseas auction. Yeah. And we slapped it, it graded MS62. At the time, that was the third finest graded, I think, or second finest graded. And um, PC just put the pedigree of the coin on the certificate so that the future, the, the, the current owner can always remember where that coin came from. And the reason it is so memorable is because it is an example of Australia's first gold coin in mint condition. It literally, it would have been minted and put aside in 1856. Somebody thought, somebody had the foresight and said, this is going to be a valuable coin and they put it aside. So that is my favorite coin. Unfortunately, it's a valuable coin. It's worth over $100,000. I couldn't afford to keep it. Uh, so I had to move it on. To Absolutely. A, to a very, yeah, yeah, sadly. Um, but there is a coin that I did buy uh, several years ago that I could afford to keep. And it, it is an 1890 Sydney Sovereign. It's a Jubilee Head Sovereign, graded MS62. And it was struck without the collar so that when the two dies came together, the plan splayed out. Yeah. So it's an oval disc with the design of a Jubilee head sovereign on it. And PC just as great as that MS62. It's the only sovereign error I've ever seen from the Australian Jubilee series ever. And it's one of a, a I've never heard of this either. Uh, you'll have to pry it from my cold dead hands before anyone else will be able to own it. For, so he, all right, you've, you've, you've given me perfect ammunition for my next query. I have okay. been told by a mentor of mine in the industry, whom you know personally, yeah. uh, one David Jobson, oh, that good friend. you cannot be a collector and a dealer. You, sir, disagree. Tell me more. <laughs> How is it possible? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I actually believe... You know, you hear all the time, don't mix your emotions with business. With coins, I completely disagree. I think you've got to mix your emotions with business. I think it's the emotions of the coins that make it worthwhile. It's worthwhile collecting coins. It's worthwhile owning them. It's worthwhile buying them. And yeah, when you buy with emotion, you do tend to buy coins. A little, maybe you pay a little bit too much. Maybe you might overpay for coins that you might struggle to sell at a later date, but maybe you won't. But I feel like as long as, as a dealer, if you stay close to what a collector really feels, what a collector feels when they look at their coins, I think you'll have a better feel for what the collector actually wants. I think it's actually a mistake to stop being a collector once you are a dealer, because then you're no longer connected to what your market is, who your market is. You want to always remember what it feels like to be a collector. And when I look at that sovereign, for example, and a few other coins that I, I have, have put aside, I remind myself what it is to be a collector. And it's not always about money. I mean, it's not always about the perfect numerical grade. And it's not always about um, how much you can sell it for or the profit you'll make on it. Sometimes it's just about appreciating the coin. And I think if you are strictly a dealer and you don't remember why you got into coins to begin with, you can um, lose touch with what it, what it means to be a collector and the collector is your customer. It's a very interesting take on it. And I feel I can relate to that a lot, particularly when it comes to feeling as though you may have overpaid. I've done that on a number of occasions and not once have yeah. I legitimately regretted it. You know, particularly know. six months, a year down the track, I look at each part of my collection with zero regret and there there i tell you there was all you know on the first few largish purchases that i ever made i was losing sleep 
a few days later, I, I, you know, I was yeah. like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm in over my head. What am I doing? Was this for yourself or for, for myself? No, no, for myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, cause, well, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, I know what that feels like. It's like, you know, it's, you it's, it's decision. yeah, you dive, you're you, really you, diving in. Not, yeah. You dive in, you think, oh, what have I done? I've spent so much money. People look to me in the auction room. They, they think I'm a dummy and a wood duck. <laughs> yeah. you know what? If you're a collector and you're looking at this coin, forget that you might be a dealer for a second. You're looking at this coin and you're thinking, I really want it. As a collector, there's somebody else in the room thinking exactly the same thing. And there'll be something, someone else thinking exactly the same thing when it comes time to sell. And that's why it's important to keep the emotions close to your purchasing. I mean, don't go crazy, but... If you yeah. like the coin, feel it, feel that, because some other collector, a true collector, is also going to like the coin. When it comes to collecting, obviously there are a, there's a myriad of ways that one can go about it, but something that is mm -hmm. seems to be quite prevalent in the PCGS community is registry set collecting. Uh, that's yeah. something I'm not very familiar with at all. Is it something you can uh, shed some light on for me? Definitely. So people can collect any way they want and there's no right or wrong way to collect. Um, but if you're a collector and you want some structure in terms of knowing what to buy, knowing what not to buy, sticking to a, a format so that you're just not buying everything you see that looks good, which is a lot of different things, you can allow the PCG set registry to guide you. And the set registry is simply a list of different sets that PCG has put together that you can collect. So you might okay. have a set $2 coins, every yep. $2 coin from 1988 to 2020. Uh, then they, you might have a type set of $2 coins where it's every design from 1988 to 2020 uh, and so on. There might be a right. date set, one I coin see. from every year. And PC just uploads these sets and you can buy, buy PC just graded coins. And with the certificate number on the, on the slab, you can add these coins to the set and build up a set. And the good thing is you can compete against other collectors all around the world who are also building the same set. And each set is rated based on the grades of the coins you've added to the set. Oh. And of course there becomes a competition between who can get the best coins, who can get the highest grades. And well, that's good for business as well, but it's exciting for the collector collectors go crazy for the best graded coins. And that's why the highest graded coins sell for such a massive premium to the lesser coins or the low graded coins. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't, I, I was not aware of that. So it's effectively like the, they've taken the old dance go push in concept. Exactly. Brought it into exactly. the 21st century. Ah, oh, cool. If you read my website, I actually, I've actually got a page there and it's called the digital dance go. And it's exactly oh. the same thing. Okay. You up the coins, you fill the gap. And actually, if you go to the PCGS website, maybe we can show some screenshots later. Yeah, for sure. They actually have a simulation of the Dansko Supreme album where they have taken cropped images of your coins, superimpose them over a Dansko album, and you click the turn the page button and it turns a page. What? And you can see all the coins turn the front and the back. And that's that's been really popular as well. So it's it's bringing bringing the digital to uh, to something that older collectors might be a bit more familiar with. Yeah. Cause that's, that's gotta be another thing, right? And that's, I suppose what you refer to when you uh, mentioned the, the 10 year time frame for the adaptation of, of mm. a new, uh, a new take on, on the hobby because transitions yeah. like that, I, you know, it's, I can see how if, even from my time in the industry, which has been predominantly whilst this is fully, it's been fully integrated, mm -hmm. I suppose you could say, but even the, the, oh, the issues for some people between the, the adjective system and the Sheldon scale and the, you know, the room for interpretation on, on the, the half grades and things like that. Um, do you think that there's a, the, a definitive scale on that? Like the, the conversion? Because it seems to be, you know, um, there are some sort of sticking points for, for certain people. Yeah. Well, it can get quite technical. And um, I'll see if I can summarize it in a way that won't bore the audience. But essentially, the Australian system grades a coin 
in a very commercial way. And the grade of uncirculated, for example, is not a strictly defined term such as a coin with lots of bag marks. An MS62 coin graded by PCGES has to meet certain criteria and it will not have wear on it and it will be covered with a moderate amount of bag marks. That is MS62, that's the definition. So any coin, whether it's a big coin or a little coin that has those characteristics will be graded MS62. In the Australian system, it's a little bit different. A threepence, for example, doesn't get that many bag marks while a crown, which is a large coin, gets a ton of bag marks. So a crown with lots of bag marks is going to be your average unk if it's got no wear on it. And a dealer will call that unk while a five cent piece or a threepence or a sixpence, tiny little coins with no bag marks, that might be the average unk. And a dealer will call that coin an unk, even though a threepence has no bag marks, as is typical, and a crown has lots of bag marks. So you'll have two different coins with two different sets of characteristics, both called unk. And that's assuming the dealer is applying the grading standard consistently. A lot of them don't because they're trying to sell the coin. So PC just gets rid of all of that and it sticks with a very strictly defined grading standard at each of the grades, 62, 63, 64, and so on. And it doesn't matter if, for example, a threepence, lots of them are free from bag marks. Lots of them look so much, they look jock gems, perfect coins. What that will mean is you'll have a lot of high grades, a lot of MS66s, a lot of MS65s. The crowns on the other hand, you're not going to get any MS65s and MS66s in any quantity. You might get one, but you'll get lots of MS62s. I hope that makes sense. That's a, a really good, uh, yeah, e explanation of the differences. And because, yeah, you're right. And it, when you're dealing with something that is subjective by its very nature, it's inevitably going to lead to certain uh, complications on occasion, which is, and I suppose... Is subjective as people think. It's they, actually quite objective. They, there you go. So I, and I think that therein lies, uh, therein lies the benefit of dealing with uh, a, reputable, a reputable, reputable dealer or company. Um, mm. You can be far more assured of that consistency in, in grading and things like that. So... Um, the beauty about it is even if you don't believe the grade, even if you think the coin is overgraded, for whatever reason, somebody else will believe the grade. Somebody else will agree with the grade. So it doesn't even matter what you think about the grading stand. I, I had this story once of a coin dealer offering me a coin um, in, let's it was an MS65 Canberra Florin. And he said to me, he said, look, it's been overgraded. It's just a normal unk. Uh, it's worth like $150. And I said, well, it says MS65. So it's an MS65 and they're worth 500. And I said to him, if you think it's, worth 150, why don't you just sell it to me for that? And he said, no, I want $500 for it. And I, I thought to myself, well, there you go. It doesn't even matter what the dealer thinks or the collector thinks if they think it's overgraded. So long as the market believes in the reputation of the, the grading service, and NGC and PC just are respected. So long as the market respects the grading service and the way that grading standard is applied, it'll be okay. It doesn't even matter what the dealer thinks, what I think about the PC just and how they grade or how they apply their grading to Australian coins. Jeez, dropping bombshells on me, dude. Wow. That's, oh, I, could, I, could, I can just, I feel like the PCGS need to get you as a, a spokesperson. You you're, you're, you're put on a very <laughs> com compelling yeah. bit of dialogue there, dude. Well, look, it, it is for the collector who actually cares about the technical aspects of the grade and assuming that you're a collector who shares PC Jess's um, view that certain things should be graded and other things should not be graded. So what I'm talking about is, for example, I believe that bag marks wear and strike are important in terms of assessing the condition of a coin. I think those things are important. Things like I appeal are less important. They affect value, but they don't affect the technical grade of a coin. And so long as you believe that as well, then PC just is a grading service for you. Jeez, you're at it again. I love it. You're not exclusively buying uh, coins that have been graded by PCGS. So when you're out on the right. boss floor, work in the room at a coin show, you yeah. need to have a keen eye for these things and understand the types of 
uh, qualities or attributes that a coin needs to have to meet your standards. And that I've, I've learned o over many years that that is an incredibly tricky thing, particularly when you go from coin to coin. Like I, I didn't have a deep appreciation for the difference between grading a sovereign and then grading pre-decimal copper and, you know, dealing with different, di different mm. compositions and different alloys and how they wear differently and things like that. So I'm, I'm waffling on, but the, the, the crux of my query is how long has it taken you to get to a point where you can pick up a coin and put your X-ray vision onto it and decide if it's, if it's up to your standards. Um, it takes a long time, but if you are sending coins to PCGS that you're looking at, so you look at a coin that's not graded, you grade it, either you write it down, you think about the coins grade, and then you send it off to PCGS, and then it comes back, and you compare your grade to PCGS's grade, that is so helpful in learning how to grade to PCGS's standard. And let's just say you and PCGS are this far apart. The idea is you send more and more coins so that the way you and PCGS grade get closer and closer. And with each iteration, you get a little bit better. You learn a little bit more about how PCGS assesses an, a, a scratch or an edge knock or friction on the high points. And with each time you send a coin over, or 10 coins or 100 coins, you get just a little bit better and a little bit better. And eventually, you should be able to grade a coin in a broad way, looking at the coin in good light, a foot away from your, from your face. Everyone says, well, you need a glass, you've got to look at it like that. And I say, no, you've got to be able to grade a coin this far away. And I'm, I'm holding the coin a foot away from my face. You should be able to grade a coin that far away from, 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 from your eyes. At least broadly, you should be able to say that's a min state coin or that coin's an AU. And then you bring it in closer with the glass and you look for problems to finesse the grade. Maybe it's a min state, but it's got a few bag marks on it. The strike's a little bit weak and it looks, it, it doesn't really look like a fresh coin. Okay, it's an MS61 or an MS62. And that takes a long time. But you need this constant cycle of thinking about a coin and grading it, mm. receiving feedback from a third party, like a PCGS, refining your understanding, doing it again, receiving another coin, refining your understanding, sending another coin over. And you really, really need the feedback. Without the feedback, it's pointless. And that's why you get some, some people in the coin business who have been dealers or collectors for a long time and they still can't identify a clean coin or a coin with an edge mark. And that is partly because they've never received feedback or uh, they've never sent their coins to PCGS. But that's so important. Feedback, feedback, feedback. Absolutely. Well, I'll give you a little bit of feedback. This has been a, a downright pleasure and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I always enjoy okay. our conversations. I always look forward to when okay. we get to catch up for a coffee. Uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to sit down and have a chat with me. I'm sure that anyone watching this okay. has gained a newfound appreciation for, for you and what, what it is that you do and your, uh, your corner of the, of the Australian numismatic market. Yeah, look, um, it was a pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for talking about one of my passions which is coins and um you know if uh, you have any other questions or any of the view your viewers have any other questions let us know i'm happy to answer them absolutely i'm sure there'll be plenty thank you very much